In this series of videos, I'm looking at the Second Amendment and relevant issues using contemporary documentation. What were they saying about these issues at the time? The first video, I looked at what you could call the national level, the uh, drafting of a constitution and the ratification of a constitution and the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the constitution. What I'm going to do now is to start moving on to the states. And in this video, the second video in the series, I'm going to focus on the biggest, most powerful, most important of all the states at the time. And that was the state of Virginia. Before, during, and immediately after the American Revolution, Virginia was the most powerful of the American colonies and later on the American states. You could say it was sort of a California of its day. It included not just Virginia and what today is West Virginia, but also Kentucky, Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Virginians even claimed parts of New York. So it was this huge colony. Again, it was rich, it was powerful. Even as a colony, it had had its own navy and army. Its soldiers fought not just in Virginia, but to the north and to the south. George Washington's brother, served in a British expedition against Panama under Admiral Vernon, which is why the state was named Mount Vernon. Washington himself had gone up with Braddock's army when they went up into western Pennsylvania to drive the French out during the uh, seven years of French and Indian Wars. He was with Braddock when he was defeated near what's now Pittsburgh, Fort Duquesne. So George Washington had a lot of military experience, and many of the Virginia militia had this large-scale militia experience fighting not just in the wilderness against Native Americans, but alongside the British against Native Americans and against the French. So Virginia was a very powerful place and a powerful economy with exports, especially tobacco, loads of slaves. Slavery was, was very big in Virginia as well. But they also had, you know, the House of Burgesses. They had had a long tradition. They taxed themselves. They ruled themselves. And they also had a very strong militia that served the colony and served it well. Virginia also had a lot of the intellectual leaders in the American colonies. When you think about Virginia, you think of Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Patrick Henry, George Mason, and many others. Virginia was a hotbed of revolutionary ideas of what would be considered progressive ideas at the time, basically the ideas that had come out of the European Enlightenments. So Virginia economically, politically, militarily, was this powerhouse of a state that was one of the foremost states in the American grouping, whether it be colonial or later on the states. Virginia was very important. And if you want to understand the terms which the Americans used and how they thought about them, it's good to look at Virginia. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. During the colonial period, the militia played a very important role in Virginia. The Virginians had had rebellions in the western part of the colony, which had to be put down by the militia. They had that expansive frontier in the west, which also required militia units to take care of when there were Indian wars and things like that. And then you had the militias that were mobilizing as things deteriorated with the British as you move toward the beginning of the American Revolution. And militia units had been dispatched, you know, on British campaigns, as I've talked about already, as far down as uh, Panama and Central America. So the militia played a central role in Virginia politics. They took their militia very seriously in the colony later on in the state. So it's important to understand what militia meant to Virginia. In 1757, the colony of Virginia passed a militia act. It was the last militia act they would pass before the beginning of the American Revolution. And what I want to do now is to, to look at it. What exactly did it say? How did they define militia? What were the implications of being in the militia? The first clause of the militia act stated that because it was a time of danger, quote, that the militia of this colony should be well-regulated and disciplined. 
Now that's language that looks a lot like the language of the Second Amendment. But if we move down to the fourth article, you'll see what it just meant by that, that the militia basically included white males who were adults, with some exceptions among the whites. There were also exceptions for people who weren't included. Basically, free mulattoes, Negroes, and Indians were not members of the militia. There were also people who were uh, what you could call uh, uh, allowed not to participate in the militia. Uh, ministers of a church, presidents or masters of professors and students of William and Mary College, keepers of public jails, overseers, millers, any workers who work in a mine, and, and a bunch of other people. But if you look at the people who were part of the militia, you'll see that what they have to do is to participate. And not only did they have a right to bear arms, they actually have a requirement to arm themselves. If you're a member of the militia, you must arm yourself. Quote, every soldier shall be furnished with a fire lock well fixed, a bayonet fitted to the same, a double cartouche box, and three charges of powder, and constantly appear with the same at the time and place appointed for muster and exercise, and shall also keep at his place of abode one pound of powder and four pounds of ball, and bring the same with him into the field when he shall be required. So if you were of militia age, you not only had a right to bear arms, you had to bear arms. Now, if you were too poor to own this kit, this weapons kit with everything that came with it, then this, the colony basically would foot the bill and give you uh, the whole setup and you weren't charged for it. Now, it would be stamped with mark that, you know, this is for property of the colony of Virginia. And if you died, it would go back to the colony. If you left the colony, you'd have to leave it. You couldn't keep it. You couldn't sell it. You couldn't steal it. You couldn't do anything to it. The people who were white and of militia eligibility but were uh, allowed not to serve, they had to pay for these weapons for the people who were too poor to arm themselves. So if you were a minister of a church, you didn't have to serve in the militia, but you had to basically pay a tax, and, this, and the colony would use that money to outfit the poor people who were going to also serve in the militia. So if you look at the Militia Act, you not only have a right to bear arms if you're in the militia, you have a requirement to bear arms. You must have a weapon, and if you can't afford one, the colony will pay for it and give it to you, loan it to you, essentially. So it's very important to understand what it meant to be in the militia in Virginia. It meant that you had to arm yourself. It wasn't an option. You were violating the law if you did not arm yourself, unless you had one of these excuses. When the Americans declared their independence, all the colonial charters were considered non-existent. So basically what the American colonies had to do were to draw up their own constitutions, new constitutions. Each of the 13 went about doing that, as did Virginia. How did Virginia handle this issue in their constitution? That's the next thing I want to look at, the constitution as it's drawn up in 1776. It reads that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people, trained to arms, is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state that standing armies in time of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty, and that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Now, almost two centuries later, Virginia added the following. Therefore, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It was not in there in 1776. They actually did not address that. And that may seem odd based on the arguments for the Second Amendment being made uh, by people who were originalists with regard to the Constitution. But if you look at the Constitution of 1776, from a perspective of the Militia Act of 1757, then it's understood to them that a well-regulated militia means a militia that's armed and that everybody who's militia eligible not only has a right to bear arms, but must bear arms. So they don't need to really mention it because that's understood given 
what they had done in 1757 and before that even with regard to the militia. And you can see this, you know, it's, it's developing and it looks like it's unclear. And that's why two centuries later, they got rid of any lack of clarity. But if you look at it within the context of the Militia Act, which had been passed you know, roughly 20 years before, you understand what a well-regulated well militia means to Virginians. It means everybody who's militia eligible has a requirement to possess a set of a weapon set, a musket, powder, bayonet, and all the other things that go with it. Twelve years later, the argument moved to the ratification convention held by Virginia. The question was, would the state ratify the newly drafted federal constitution? And of course, it was important for the country, if it was going to exist as what becomes the federal government, to have Virginia ratify. If Virginia hadn't ratified, the whole thing would have fallen apart. Now, part of the deal to get Virginia to ratify involved amendments, proposed amendments, and there were many of them. There, there were more than 10. There were, there were a slew of them. And some of them were very long and very extensive. And if you look at them and then you look at the Bill of Rights, you can understand the process that's going on here. Now, what I want to do now is to look at one of those amendments involving the concept of the right to bear arms, because I think it's really important. So let me put that up now and we'll look at it. As, as I said, it's important to keep in mind that bringing Virginia into the Union was very important. Uh, there were 168 delegates at the ratification convention. The final vote was relatively close, 89 to 79. If six people had voted differently, Virginia would not have ratified. But it did. And one of the reasons it did was because there were assumptions. There were promises made. If you look at the ratification convention document, it states that there be a declaration or bill of rights asserting and securing from encroachment the essential and unalienable rights of the people in some such manner as the following. There follow 16 of these suggested amendments, some of which are, are very long. The one I'm going to focus on here is the relevant one to this question, and that's the 17th. And it reads, that the people have a right to keep and bear arms semicolon, that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state, semicolon, that standing armies in time of peace are dangerous to liberty and therefore ought to be avoided as far as the circumstances and protection of a community will admit, semicolon, and that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. So this 17th proposed amendment that came out of Virginia, which is, again, without Virginia, there's no federal government, has four points, independent sentences linked by semicolons. And the first one stated, which you would take to be the most important, that the people have a right to keep and bear arms. That's what comes first. Then... You talk about a well-regulated militia, and then standing armies, and then civilian control of the military. There are the four things. Now, in many ways, those get jammed into, or at least parts of them do, into the Second Amendment. And if you look at the Second Amendment, you can see that. But if you look back at what the Virginians were saying in the Ratification Convention, how would you interpret the Second Amendment as written with reference to the Ratification Convention? Of that sentence, because of a well-regulated militia, the people have a right to bear arms, should not be infringed. If you look at number 17 of the proposed amendments, you can see that the governing element here is, number one, that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, period. Then comes the militia, then come the other things. So if you look at the ratification convention, I think it's pretty clear how Virginians at the time would have 
interpreted the Second Amendment. As I said in the previous lecture, the controlling element is the part that's a complete sentence, that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's it. That's the governing element of the Second Amendment. And if you look at the Virginia Militia Act, the Virginia Constitution, and the, uh, the proposed amendment that they're offering at the ratification convention, I think it's perfectly clear. So that's the story from Virginia. And I think if you look at everything going back to the Militia Act, you know, up to the ratification convention, it's pretty clear how Virginians and Virginians were writing much of the Bill of Rights, how they would have interpreted the Second Amendment, that the important element was the complete sentence. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, what I'm going to do next in the next couple of videos is to look at the other states. I'm not going to do one video in each state. It's, it's not necessary. Some of the some of them don't even address the issue. But I'm going to take a story into the early 1820s. In uh, July 4th, 1826, both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died. And you could say at that point, the degeneration of the founders had ended. And that's about where I'm going to end this video series as well. And I think when I get there, when I get to the end, you'll see that there's really only one way you can interpret the Second Amendment. If you're getting things out of these videos and you want to see more of them, then please support the channel. And you can do that by subscribing, uh, leaving a comment, letting me know other historical topics you'd like to see me address, uh, follow the channel, hit the notification button, share the video with your friends. And until the next time, thank you. And I'm out of here.